Good morning. When a man is about to be hanged, it concentrates his mind wonderfully. Now, I didn't dream that up. Sam Johnson said it in 1777. And that's exactly how Pierre Trudeau must feel this morning. Because just as yesterday's mini general election was an absolute and total disaster. The Tories made a clean sweep in Ontario. The Liberals didn't win a single solitary seat outside of Quebec. And the spectre must rise in Trudeau's mind this morning that if he sticks around for the general election next year, that he could be the leader of a rump Liberal Party based almost entirely in Quebec. Now, I did not subscribe to the theory that the hatred of Trudeau was so strong that this would happen in yesterday's election. But I'm quite sure the backroom boys in Toronto, Keith Davy and company, and those up on the hill, are scratching their heads now and saying, even that magnificent charisma on the hustings cannot bring back the fortunes of the Liberal Party. Because what happened yesterday was, and I put a number of these questions to Pierre myself the other week, is that people have not forgotten the incompetence of the government. They've not forgotten the apparent waste. They've not forgotten the index pensions. They've not forgotten lip and leap and lap and lop and lop and all the rest of the strange schemes. They've not forgotten the confusion about what's going to happen to family allowances. They've not forgotten the changes that are coming in unemployment insurance. And people think, well, I'm going to go off and I'm going to go on welfare or they're giving them too much in UIC and they're going to put them on welfare. And the country, quite obviously, and it was demonstrated yesterday, is in a leaderless capacity. Will Trudeau quit? He'll quit if he's pushed hard enough. My own personal prediction, with which I shall now be stuck, is that he will not quit and that he will lead the Liberal Party in the next election. But yesterday, let's face it, there's no excuses for them. It was a disaster. Now, in the studio this morning, I have a cabinet minister. Very fine fellow indeed, I'm sure. And he was responsible for this disaster about the Americano beer and the unemployed in the brewery and all the rest of it. And is he going to have a half-price sale, as Norman Levy suggests? The man, of course, is the Honorable Rafe. Call him Ralph and he'll leave the studio. The Honorable Rafe Mayer, Consumer and Corporate Affairs in Victoria. The man in charge of beer, cabarets, confederation, constitution, consumer affairs, and whatnot. And we shall have at Mr. Mayer in a minute or two. Rafe, how are you this morning? You this morning? I'm just fine, Jack, with a terrible cold, and I hope I give it to you. I shall you deserve it. You don't mind if I call you Rafe? I always do. 15 seconds. I'd love some more. Four. So would I. Hot coffee, please. Mr. Mayor. Good morning, Jack. M A I R. You're not right. the mayor of Good Scottish name, Jack. You're the mayor of the Consumer and Corporate Affairs. That's correct. For a change, Norm Levy came up with a very good idea the other day in which you sh I want you to announce it this morning for the benefit of all our listeners. A half-price sale of all that leftover Yankee beer which your people so ill-advisedly ordered in such a panic putting British Columbia brewery workers out of jobs. How about that? Half-price sale. Well, Norm is still batting a thousand. His ideas are no better. Uh, what his suggestion ignores, Jack, is that it's not just clearing the beer off the shelves that's a problem. It's uh, getting it down people's gullets. Because until people consume all that American beer, it's still going to be uh, a problem uh, preventing the purchase of Canadian beer. If uh, now, when that's I why say, I'm suggesting a half price. Sale. Well, sure. All you right. Now, so you go, out, you go out and buy ten cases of beer, and uh, now you've got them. Are you going to just leave them in your basement, or are you going to consume them before you go back and buy some more beer? If you're the normal consumer, you're going to consume them. Now, the Canadian beer, in the meantime, while you're consuming that ten cases of American beer, is sitting in the store instead of sitting in the brewery. That hasn't advanced their case one bit. Did you know? So the, the problem is not just getting it out of the store, Jack. It's getting it consumed. You mean it was that bad? No, no, no. It's not a question of it being that bad. We have two alternatives. Either we pour it down the drain at the cost of the taxpayer, great cost of the taxpayer, or we get rid of it in the normal course of events. 
Now, as a matter of fact, as you know, we've made a pretty good deal with the breweries where they're going to pick up the losses, uh, you know, that, uh, that we sustain. Uh, that, uh, uh, nevertheless, the problem is not so simple as that you can just have a sale and get rid of it because that does not get rid of the problem. It just puts the problem out of the liquor store into somebody's basement. Have you cut the price on this American we beer? We cut the uh, price down initially. We haven't since. We don't intend to. What is this about the breweries uh, sustaining the losses? I missed that one. Ah, you see. You're giving you, them some kind of edge or No, other? no, no. They're giving us some kind of edge. Oh, tell me about it. Well, uh, they're going to, uh, if we lose at the end of this, uh, this go-round on the American beer, they're going to pick up the losses for us. Uh, we have, on the other hand, undertaken to uh, immediately get normal supplies of Canadian beer back at the liquor store. Oh, that's the quid pro quo. That's the quid pro quo. If you'll forgive my that, big Latin. That's correct. In other words, if you'll take your ordinary orders, they'll pick up the losses they'll on the They'll pick up the price. losses. That's correct. The losses that the taxpayers would otherwise sustain. You're such a hypocrite, though, you and the whole government, aren't you? No, of course we're not, Jack. Well, you know of course you we're are. Not. You know you are. I'll be quite well, specific. Do you want me to be sure, specific? Sure, please. What did you make last year in booze? You make on booze, like on the As demon. a government or as a ministry? As a government. As a government, we probably lost a couple of billion dollars. Oh, no, don't give me that sure, pap answer. You, you know yeah, perfectly well, Mr. You Minister, know what I'm you know asking it. you. I'm asking you for the benefit of short-minded people, short-memoried people, what the net profit was on the sale of booze last year. The bottom line of, uh, of liquor sales was probably something in the order of $180 million. Now, are you going to ask me how much we put out in human resources, in labor, no, in attorney I'm not. general? I see. You only want the one just, side of it. I want it because okay. the rest is sheer hypocrisy, but as there, you and I both know. The other spoils a good story, is what no, you're no. saying. No, sure. no. You can't tell me that we had a total social loss of a billion dollars and human lives damaged and all the rest of it. Because if you were serious about that, you'd stop selling booze. No, because we've uh, had that experiment in the United States and elsewhere, and we've seen all the what happened is we increased the problems because you didn't stop the drinking. Mm -hmm. uh, Jack, we have to recognize the fact that there is going to be drinking, people are going to consume alcohol, and we're going to have that social cost. But you're not going to get me to say that the government ever makes profit on alcohol because it simply does not. Sure helps to pay at other bills. It sure helps to pay the bills caused by the abuse of alcohol, if that's what you want me to say, and, that's uh, true. Just to pin you on this one last thing, you said $189 million. You cannot show me anywhere in your government where $189 million is allocated for alcohol prevention or rehabilitation of drunks. Well, no, but you, you don't operate a government that way, Jack. You don't say the money that comes in from even licensing automobiles goes into, into the carnage caused on the highways. You don't operate no. that way. You operate on money in, money out. Rafe, let's drop that subject. Okay. There's nothing to it. Let's get after you on another little thing. I see, Why, I'm, I when see I'm certified sober by last night's paper in any event. You mean so. Danny Boyd's yeah, column? Yeah. Matter of fact, to be personal for a moment, you have lost so much weight that if you turn sideways to the camera, they won't see you. Well, that's why I uh, gave up drinking for uh, as long as it took me to lose weight. How much weight have you lost? Uh, 55 pounds. So you're now down to 170? No, 178. 178 pounds. 178 pounds. And you only four foot six. I'm only four foot six. That's right. I'm not too heavy. I'm just too short. No. <laughs> but how long did it take you to lose it? Uh, about three months. Well, forget the interview. What was your diet apart from not drinking? Well, that was the big part of it. And uh, keeping down to about 1,200 calories a day. I finally uh, agreed that calories count. I used to fool myself that they didn't, but they do. You're they not do. one of these idiots, no names, no pack drill, who goes out jogging every morning. No, no, but I play squash, Jack. Well, I play racquetball. Do you? Probably beat you at it anyway. Well, I very much doubt that. Back to your hypocrisy. All right, back to my hypocrisy. Big announcement the other day. She, <coughs> you know, things of press releases. That you're going to put out booze in 40-ounce bottles. BC booze only in 40-ounce bottles. Why? Why? Why not? Because it's a gross way to buy alcohol and encourages overindulgence, Mr. Mayor. Well, I don't know that it does, Jack. The people that uh, buy 40-ounce bottles, don't forget, to a large degree, are people that uh, are licensees, and it's a very convenient way for them to, to buy booze. Well, sell it only to but, licensees. But, you know, uh, there's nothing to prevent people from buying uh, two or three bottles of, of whiskey if they want, or, or cases of it. Uh, there's been uh, a consumer demand to go back to the 40-ounce bottle. I suggest that it was consumer pressure from the, the dist local distillery, pressure from the local distilleries who want to get their big bottles on the shelf so that people will only buy Potter's Park and Tilford with one other. Uh, doesn't matter. Pot, doesn't matter, no. What, uh, Walker's. Well, yeah, Hyde Walker. Walker. Hyde Walker. Walker, right. No, uh, that's not true, Jack. I mean, it's uh, encouraging gluttony and booze to sell it in 40-ounce bottles no, in the liquor stores. No, no, I don't think that that's, uh, that's just like saying that uh, getting uh, uh, two packages of soap for the price of one is encouraging uh, the use of a washing machine. That's not true at all. Next question. You know my feelings on that. The good Presbyterian background that I have. Oh, absolutely, It's Jack. well back, but yes. it's still... Uh, <laughs> the good part's well back, anyway. 
Um, I had an old friend of yours on there yesterday. Oh, tell me about him. Joe Filipponi. Oh, yeah. I don't think you're, uh, well, maybe you're treating him properly, but not fairly. Well, Jack, first this of all. This moratorium on the cabaret licenses, when he was cleared, at least when he beat all the charges against him, looks like it's aimed against him and him alone. All right, let, let's make two points. First of all, uh, being acquitted of living off the avails of prostitution hardly makes you little Lord Fauntleroy all of a sudden, number one. Number two, uh, I haven't done anything to Joe Filipponi or to any of his brothers or to any of his family. My role uh, comes up if he intends to appeal the decision that the Liquor Control and Licensing Branch rendered. You're the now, judge. I am the judge. And uh, as best as I'm able, uh, with the limited talents God gave me, I will judge that fairly, when, if and when it comes before me. Until that time, uh, I really haven't got too much to say, except one thing I wish Mr. Fon uh, Filipponi would stop trying the issue publicly. And uh, if he wants to appeal, bring his appeal on. But you can't avoid trying that kind of issue publicly. As I told him yesterday, his bad image has been the center of public attention for lo these many years in Vancouver. Then you, in the terms of the authorities, spend a million bucks on a charge or a series of charges which get wiped out. So naturally he comes back and says, look, I'm clean, I'm little Lord Fauntleroy, right? Everything I did was, le was not illegal, and yet you're specifically discriminating <coughs> against me. And on the face of that, he has a case. After this break. Of course, the reason you picked up this cold, you're sniffling away like mad during the break, is because you've lost all your resistance by losing the 55 pounds of flab. Well, that's right, and I'm not taking the uh, common Hibernian um, uh, remedy. remedy for it. Nor that, should that, you. Nor should I, all right. No. Okay. Now, uh, disassociated, but related to the Filipponi thing. Trafficking and liquor licenses. I remember well some time ago when your policy of the government, I forget which one now, was that when liquor licenses were transferred, the license would go and there'd be no money made in peddling liquor licenses. Yeah. I'm reliably informed that you have done nothing to implement that policy and that two establishments recently sold for 150 small ones and $225,000, a couple more on the market for a lot of money. And yet, will you discourage the actual trafficking, or can you do anything to discourage the trafficking and the amount of money made on the people's license? Yeah, we've done a, a fair amount, Jack. Uh, I think in, when you think about it, you'll agree. Um, the, the reason that there has been the profit in neighborhood pub licenses, for example, is the size of the pub. I mean, it's just simply a license to print money at 100 seats plus 25 standees. Uh, that's one of the reasons that we reduced the size down to 50 or 60. Uh, because that is a mom-and-pop operation like it was intended to be. Now, there's nothing wrong with a person taking any business and building it up and selling it at a profit. But what is wrong is a person getting a piece of paper from, from the government, from me, and trading in that. Now, I don't think that you're seeing anybody trade in a, in a license for a 50- or 60-seat pub. If you gave me a license for a 100-seat pub, I'd trade that at a handsome profit tomorrow without ever, ever using a, a brick or a piece of mortar. Yeah, just a minute. And you'd be allowed to do that? Oh, well, at how presently, would, but... How it, would your other half uh, may have stop you from doing well, that? Well, by not, uh, not licensing any more establishments of that size, Jack, that's the point. Rather than step in with a lot of complicated rules about how much a person can or can't make and let's see your balance sheet when you sell your institution, we're simply not going to license people. But that makes the ones already licensed even more valuable. Oh, I don't think that, uh, that it does make them any more valuable. They remain valuable, sure. And uh, you're you right that I have not stepped in on those ones, and uh, why, I have no intention of doing why so. Why don't you make. take a share of the sale price of a license on a formula to make sure that we get some of our value of our license back in the public coffer? Well, Jack, I, uh, I tend to... Haven't you got such legislation? No, I haven't got such legislation, but I tend to feel, Jack, that those people that got those licenses at, those, at that time under those rules are entitled to be treated as if those rules still existed. I'm not going to go back and, and interfere with licenses that were granted, I think, erroneously. Witness. But I am, going to, I am going to bring in uh, 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 licenses which should, don't lend themselves to that kind of treatment, which we have done. You mean specific licenses which you can't transfer? 
not that you can't transfer, but that by the nature of the license do not lend themselves to a quick windfall profit. As of the moment right now, there is nothing to stop me trafficking a license if I'm lucky enough to get one and make a quick windfall profit, is there? No, there isn't, Jack, but, uh, you know, I'd look very carefully before you do, you know. Uh, a lot of the neighborhood pubs, even the big ones, are not doing nearly as well as you'd like to think I'm they I'm not might. talking about the pubs. I'm talking about downtown places that are, that, uh, whereby I was convinced that there was legislation whereby you got a share of the profit on a sale or the value of the license. Then you'll have to find it for me, Jack, because I don't know where it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, we would like to discourage it, uh, as I say, by the type of license we grant. And I think we're doing that. But you're a bit odd when you say you're going to control this by not issuing more licenses. See, by no, the no, Filiponi, no, no. this is where one must sympathize with the man. I told him yesterday that he had a bad headache because his halo was killing him. Uh, but you got must sympathize with him in that your fellow, whatever his name is, your bureaucrat, says uh, uh, we have created a moratorium on cabaret licenses because of the bankruptcies of this kind of business and that kind of business. Doesn't make any sense. Why can't a man get a license and go broke on his own money if he wants to? <laughs> because he's going broke, Jack, selling something which um, is not uh, a box of soap suds and it's not an automobile. It's something that is an inherently dangerous product. You know that and I know that. Uh, and it's one that is, uh, is very frequently abused. And uh, uh, if you were going to uh, follow the theory that you're following, you'd let anybody have a license, regardless of their, uh, their moral background, of their uh, business background, of, uh, of their ability to handle what is um, something that demands a degree of responsibility. And uh, sure, I'm a free enterpriser and I believe in the free marketplace. But if you were just to let anybody who wanted to have a liquor license have one, then I think you'd have a very serious situation. And we already have a serious enough one. Sure got knocked down on your consumer protection, didn't you, on the TV repairs, eh? You muffed that one. No, we didn't muff it at all. I'm very pleased with the results of that, Jack. I think that uh, TV repairmen and car repairmen responded very well to, uh, to what they perceived to be uh, a threat. Let's use that word. And uh, I think that uh, the act is uh, well, very thoroughly cleaned up. Let's threaten them some more. As I understand it, you have a bunch of qualified snoops out in the field now. <laughs> Just a minute. Just a minute. <laughs> Don't laugh too yeah. hard. Yeah, okay. Qualified snoops out to protect me by taking and phoning well, up. Thank TV. God they're not unqualified snoops, at least. All right. Taking and phoning up TVs and broken down used cars to try and catch traders. Are you doing that? Yes. Good for you. Yeah. I don't object to that. No, I don't either. I just want you to get prosecutions when you lay. Want you to get convictions when you lay charges. Well, we uh, we laid one charge and we lost it. Uh -huh. You know, but uh, you win some, lose some, I suppose, when it comes to court cases. But, yeah. Uh, the uh, the results of our uh, latest. Um, uh, enterprise, if I can use that word, are not in yet, but I can tell you uh, that uh, they're very encouraging. You're having a crackdown on used car dealers now, aren't you? That's unusual no, for a social credit no, government, We, we by passed the way. a very good uh, Motor Dealers Act, which uh, puts oh, a lot of rules in place. Put a little sticker on the bonnet, yeah. is that all? That's part of it. What That's else? Part of it. Oh, they have to tell you, uh, if a car came from out of province, they have to tell you uh, what condition it was in, whether it was a taxi, whether it was a wreck, whether it was a police car, all of these various things. Is this now in force? Uh, January the 1st. Do they have to guarantee that there are no liens on it? Uh, no, I don't think so, Jack. Big but hole in the act? Well, we're going to clean that up, too, because that's more a big hole in the, uh, in the registry system. That's, mm -hmm. that's one of the big problems we've got. But uh, I'm not certain of that, quite frankly. I don't have the act with me. But that act is coming in January the 1st? January the 1st. Uh, must they be passed through the city test in any area before they're sold? No, that's not another big hole in your act. Well, we haven't got city tests in too many places, Jack. In Victoria and Vancouver, but we don't have them elsewhere. Well, if we're within 25 miles of a city testing, it should go through, because well, that's the biggest racket pulled by used car dealers. Well, maybe you've got a good point, Jack, but we haven't got that as yet. But I think if you read the act and the regulations, you'll see it's a pretty good statute. You think you, the the, the slim, emaciated mayor with a bad cold, could tackle the Constitution for a couple of minutes? You bet I could. You we'll bet I do could. that. You still doing your open line radio show in Kamloops? No, Jack, they retired me. Put me out to pasture. You were too old for it. Well, I didn't have the accent. I know how old you look this morning, but how old are you? I'm, uh, I'll be 47 on the last day of this year. Is I'm that all? Here. That's all, Jack. Just 47. But I've lived a hard life. It certainly looks life. like it this morning. Yeah, it feels put, like it this morning. Put some weight back on. No, I don't think so, Jack. Fat people look younger. Well, I guess you'd have to say that, wouldn't you? <laughs> Forget the Constitution. I'm right. sick and tired of the Constitution. Okay. It's hopeless anyway. It's your show. I mean, there's nobody can do anything about the Constitution. Well, I don't agree with you.
If, if that's true, then we really are in trouble. I think we're in enough trouble as it is, but we really are in trouble if that's true. I've come to the considered opinion with all my years of trivia that uh, we should stick with the BNA Act and fight it out an issue at a time. Probably right, you know. Yeah, I, you know, I don't think that's far uh, from what we're thinking, Jack. Uh, we've lived with the BNA Act for 111 years. Uh, mm. Why not uh, bring it up to date? Why do we have to throw it out like a baby with the bathwater? Forget the baby, forget the bathwater, okay. let's get the dirty pictures. Dirty pictures. Yeah. You know, in the city of Vancouver, we have a downtown Skid, not Skid Road, yeah, downtown East Side Hotel, which gaily shows porn uh, pornographic, obscene, filthy movies. Sign the paper, take your party up and watch the dirty movies. Then we have that Japanese film, The Realm of the Senses, which, you know, my wife wouldn't let me go and see it anyway. But it showed but a she couple. She won't let you go see Bambi. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, we uh, it showed a couple of times somewhere out in Vancouver, <coughs> and then the city police stepped in and said, "Oh, the prosecutor, show that again, and we'll charge you." Now that was some two-bit local bureaucrat cutting your throat because you're the minister in charge of dirty pictures. I don't think the issue is quite that, Jack. I think that um, after the film classifier uh, says it's okay to show a film under whatever circumstances. It's still very much open to the uh, police authorities to say, notwithstanding that, in our opinion, it is obscene under the appropriate sections of the criminal code, and here's a piece of blue paper, please appear in court, and we'll test it in court and see whether we're right or we're wrong. The, the issue uh, in that particular case was whether or not the prosecutor could say, all right, uh, you showed that once, don't do it again. Because if you do, we will charge you. Well, that's threat. Well, that's the position. Intimidation. That's the position. Coercion. That's the position. Blackmail. Uh, those are almost the words that I perhaps inadvisedly used. And did you use them to your distinguished legal colleague, uh, Mr. Gardy Garden, the Attorney General? Uh, I, I think that Gardy and I had a, a, a thorough discourse on the subject, sure. And I don't think uh, that that really is the point. Uh, Gardy is no more responsible for what each one of his prosecutors does, and I am for each one of the individual liquor stores, uh, but I hope or whatever. But hope he stepped in and slapped the fellow on the wrist, whoever it was. Well, you'd have to ask, uh, ask my colleague what he did. Uh, the problem is, is uh, as far as I'm concerned, satisfactory ended. Mm -hmm. Well, now, the Constitution's no good. We can't talk about that. Consumer affairs is dull. You have a huge, vast bureaucracy now. Which yeah, 98 people. Is that all? In the consumer side, yeah. And what about the corporate side? Oh, well, when you get all the liquor store people in, it's probably 2,500. And they're all index pensions. Oh, well, they've all done very well. They've all got index sure. pensions all done in the very provincial well. government, haven't all they? All done very well, Jack. Is there any move by the social credit, by ministers like yourself of power and authority to cut back on these index pensions? Well, Jack, I think that, uh, you know, that's something that uh, you'd have to get my colleague, uh, Mr. Wolf, or something Oh, like when that it comes to in. election time, you'll be advising opinions on it, won't you it? Know, I, I think that, uh, you know, from my own perspective, uh, that what we've done in, uh, in freezing the, uh, the numbers in the civil service uh, by uh, working through attrition to cut them back, that's, that's been uh, a good How'd you like to take some telephone calls? Sure, I'd Are love you to. fit to answer telephone oh, you calls? Betcha. you betcha. Henry, I'm going to take a break now, and I'm going to come back very shortly. The lines are free. And the numbers, you know, no, I don't, 299-1371 and long distance collect 299-1303. Hold on, please. Where? Which line? 1303. I can't see without my glasses. 1304. Are you there in Rossland? Have you a question for the minister? 30 seconds. Now hold on and go straight at him. Don't say good morning or where is he or what I have you. Hold on please. You'll be the first call. You'll be, you, you'll be the first call. Are you there? Hold on please. You'll be the second call. Hold on please. Are you there? You'll be the third call. Don't go away. Are you listening to me? Yeah. Bring it up. You're the third call. Hold on please. Don't go away. From Rossland to you, Mr. Mayor. And, uh, yes. Well, I know there are difficulties, but what are they in regard to uh, the beer? I understand the beer is good from, what, 30 to 90 days, and, and this U.S. beer, uh, on what terms was it brought in on, and, and can it be resold again in the States or, or any other place outside of E.C., and what are the difficulties? Well, first of all, it's about 90 to 120 days. Uh, secondly, uh, we at no time had more than two weeks' supply of beer on hand. 
Uh, that's about a million cases per week we sell out of the, out of the LDB. Uh, thirdly, I suppose the problem is that as long as the strike was going on, we were big heroes to the, uh, to the consumer of beer. The day that it ended, we were bums because we had beer left over. And, um, you know, I think I can, uh, can defend our merchandising by saying that uh, we had between a week and a half and two weeks supply of beer under normal beer-consuming circumstances. But can it be, uh, at what terms was it brought in on, and can it be uh, resold at a discount anywhere? Well, we can probably talk the American breweries into taking some of it back. But, you know, I think you must remember that most of the American breweries geared up to about 95% production from about 75% in order to handle the, the new trade that developed north of the border. And uh, having got their money for their beer, they're not terribly interested in taking it back at this point, and I don't say that I blame them. Why should they? Go ahead, please. Go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, I'd that? like to ask Mr. Mayor why the uh, province of British Columbia doesn't go to the system they use in Quebec of just selling beer in the grocery stores. Well, this has been asked to me a number of times lately, sir, and let me say this. I, I don't think under the uh, mood of the present government, uh, the same as under the previous government, that you're going to see that immediately. However, I've said before, and I'll say it again now, I think that that's coming in the near future. When I say the near future, I mean the next four, five, six years. Because I think that the consumers in B.C. are going to insist upon it. They're going to make their MLAs aware of the fact that they want that kind of merchandising, and it'll come that way. At the present time, if you canvassed uh, both our caucus and the NDP caucus, you would find too much opposition to it. You're certainly hammering the drinker, though. I noticed that a bottle of a liqueur went up $2.50 the other day. Well, I, $2 think the, uh, I think the public of Canada spoke to Mr. Trudeau about that last night because that's the performance of the Canadian dollar that's done that, Jack. It's got nothing to do with me. It's well, just costing bit. us that much more to buy liqueur. You always chisel a little extra. Well, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> well, uh, we make a markup on what we take in, sure. That's right. Sure. And then you've got us, you've upped the price what of import. What do you think I do? Spend that money personally, Jack? You know, you've upped the price of imported wines to make us drink the local stuff. Well, that goes to help people on Salt Spring Island with their farming problems. Oh, don't give me that garbage, <laughs> Ray. Go ahead to Rafe Mayer. <laughs> Very funny. Go Good morning, on. Jack. Good morning, Ray. Good morning. Rafe, what happened to that million dollars in missing booze that the press was asking you about several months ago? Well, that uh, little hyperbole was started by this man that you're looking at right across the, the desk from me here. Let's have an answer. Well, well first of all, you've got to tell the story. There was a, a theft of a fair amount of booze yeah. which went out through a sewer which ran underneath the Lincoln distribution store somewhere on Broadway. Right? That's right, Jack. And we, when I asked you how much, you wouldn't deny a million dollars, so the million dollar tag was put on it. What was the exact amount stolen? I don't think we'll ever know, Jack. All we do know is that we had absolutely unbelievable security in the liquor distribution. Under uh, the NDP, of course. Well, and under us, too, before that, uh, you know, it just has been an area that's been unattended by any government. Have you now stopped the theft yes. through the through we've, sewer pipe? We've done, we've done a lot of things, uh, such as uh, put in some locks and keys and some security people and, and that sort of thing. It's under control. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, yes, I'd sir. like to put this question to you. When does the provincial government plan to get out of the dark ages and allow uh, liquor advertising back on the radio? Well, I don't know that uh, getting out of the dark ages is right, and we're certainly not going to allow it back because it's never been there in the first place. Why? But, but all right, uh, you, I'll give you a very good answer, I think, and you think about this for a second. If you were to advertise an automobile, uh, you would uh, tell people that it lasts longer than other cars, that it performs better, that it doesn't break down as often, and all the rest of it. If you were advertising alcohol, though, you wouldn't go out and say, look, this alcohol doesn't give you as bad a hangover as the other alcohol does. This uh, alcohol doesn't make you as sick if you drink too much. This alcohol doesn't affect your liquor as much as the, as the other product. What the ad will tell you is that if you drink my booze, you get the girl, you get the car, and you float down the river on a raft. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, until there is real truth in advertising of, of alcohol, uh, I don't ever want to see it come on, uh, on radio or television. How do you like that? Oh, from the point of view of the man in the street, of course, that again, with respect, deference, and humility, is garbage. No, it's not, Jack. Well, it's the truth. When have you ever seen alcohol advertised truthfully? Never. But it's advertised phony in the magazines, the newspapers, uh, all kinds of things. Now you've got me. Now you've got me. I must admit that that is and something... And you had... No, you don't advertise. This problem, this event no, be. no, no, that, that went out a long, long time Beer ago. Beer commercials from the United States. Oh, sure, and, uh, you know, there, there, there are two ways of looking at that, however, sir. One, we can ape them by allowing beer and wine ads on television and radio here, or we can go the Saskatchewan route and try and block it coming in on cable vision, and that's a route that we may very well follow. Well, I know you've got lots of calls. I just hope you change your mind someday. 
Thank okay, you. Why, why do you, may I just ask you, why do you want to see uh, beer and wine advertised on TV and radio? I might say this, that the breweries aren't wildly enthusiastic. I just don't see the fact that you can look in a magazine and it's just loaded with advertising. They're making a, a buck off of that, and uh, there's uh, this... Uh, well, that part I discussion. agree with you. You know what, that's inconsistent, and I plead guilty in to fact, that, but... You but, would ban the lot if you could. Oh, yeah, sure, if I could. You betcha. You're kidding. No, I'm not, Jack. Go ahead, please. I okay, you. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. When Mr. Bradster said that we can see some of these movies up in the, w in the east of Vancouver, how come we can't buy it from the stores? I can't understand. When you can see some of these dirty movies in, in hotels in downtown Vancouver, what's the rest of your question? Yeah, why can't you buy it from the stores? Why can't you buy what, dirty movies? Yeah. Well, because it's against the law to do both, sir. The dirty movies in the east end of Vancouver are against the law, I pre no, presume. No, they're not. Well, they're, if they're not against the law, then they, they do not offend the obscenity laws, and you can buy uh, movies in the stores now that don't offend the obscenity laws. No, 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 These no, ones no. actually, in my opinion, do. There, Never mind, really it's always somebody's opinion. That's the problem, isn't it? That's right. Go yeah. ahead, please. As a matter of fact, it was me that told the mayor of Vancouver, Volrich, that he had licensed a place which was showing dirty movies if you signed the consent paper down in the El Cid, or what do you call it, Campbell Street. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Webster. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. I wanted you to rescind the statement that you just stated about movies. Uh, you call that uh, chap, the Crown Prosecutor, a uh, uh, two-bit something or other Two-bit bureaucrat? Me? Did I say that, Rafe? You did say that earlier in the program. Which one was I talking about? You're saying that about anybody that's a, you know, a member of the Crown. Jack, I Are don't... Are you offended? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, madam. I should have said a bureaucrat. Right. An interfering I... bureaucrat. Yeah, you have but to not, watch your statements, Mr. Yeah, but not a two-bit bureaucrat. I'll concede I was wrong, and I apologize humbly. Thank you very much. Thank also, you. I'd like to ask, Mr. Mayor, why can't we, as taxpayers of the province, enjoy the Canadian beer already? You can. Yeah, you can, ma'am. And uh, as a matter of fact, as of yesterday, uh, supplies uh, back into the liquor stores are normal. Are uh, they? Yep. Well, but, I'm glad to hear that. But, uh, you know, the same people who are now complaining that they can't get beer in the in the liquor stores were delighted to be able to get beer in the liquor stores, American beer, when the strike was on. You know, I, I'm literally damned if I do and damned if I don't in that situation. Well, last week we walked into one of the branches and we were forced to buy the large tins of the American beer. Yeah. Which, which large thing. tins you would have been delighted to see during the time that the strike was on? You know, this is this is the problem. Perhaps. And yeah, thank perhaps you for correcting me, ma'am. Okay, sir. <coughs> thank okay. you. Go ahead, please. Yeah, hello. Yes, sir. Yeah. Directly, uh, directed to Ralph. Uh, Rafe. I'm talking about, uh, he says he loses money. But what? I understand that uh, the LCB is just a uh, constant quarter per, uh, quarterly, quarterly uh, raising the prices. They go up all the time. No, they don't. No, that's not true. Well, that's not true. No, no, the, the liquor prices will go up from, uh, uh, from several different sources. The two main ones are we are putting them up as a government, which has happened uh, in my term of office uh, once, and they will go up on other occasions when it costs us more to buy the product. As a Canadian good dollar goes down, the price of imported materials like liquor must just, go just up. Just like Toyota cars or anything else that's imported that goes up. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'd just like to address myself to Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Um, this is concerning the uh, moratorium on liquor licenses. Um, uh, which, which one? Uh, well, the one in New Westminster that uh, apparently the city of New Westminster is not aware of. Well, that's, there is none in New Westminster. The city of New Westminster did have a moratorium on neighborhood pubs, but so far as I know, there, there, is no, there are no others. Is this the case of the man who got the tentative approval to go through everything, spent $40,000 and then was hit by the moratorium? That's correct. Yes, one of my people spoke to you yesterday briefly about that. This is an interesting case, Mr. Mayor. Do you want to give your name on the air? Yes, my name is John Lowe. John Lowe, and what's your establishment? Uh, the establishment would, would be proposed called Time and Place. And what is it, a pub? Uh, well, it was formerly known as the uh, Foxy Mermaid, which was a, a quite a rundown strip joint. Anyway, what was your problem? You, did you get tentative approvals from whom? Well, we approached the LCB originally to uh, make application and find out exactly what we had to do. And we were notified by the uh, chief inspector in the Lower Mainland that we were required before he could proceed any further and anything leave the top of his desk that we uh, obtain provincial fire marshal approval, city approval, a valid lease, 
and uh, city police approval. Did you get all those things? Yes, we did. And then did you go back to get your license? That's right. How much did you spend in the meantime? Pardon me? How much did you spend? Um, well, in terms of actual cost, we're probably in the area right now of about 20000 When well, promised Just getting permission? You got to spend tw How do you spend $20,000 getting permission from fire marshals and that sort of thing? Well, we have to obtain a lease, which requires rent payments. We also, to meet the city approval, we had to make extensive uh, alterations to emergency lighting well, that's systems. That's the point I want. Okay. And to get their final approval from their electrical inspector before they would give us a lettering or writing, which the LCB said they required. Okay. This is, a, this is a cabaret we're talking about? Yes, it is. Okay. So you then applied for your cabaret license? Yes, we did. Having given previous notice of your application? That's correct. And they said, no, there's a moratorium? That's right. Has he been caught in the Philip moratorium by accident? Jack, I don't know, but I'm, I've got his name, Mr. John Lowe, I believe it is. Yes, sir. And uh, Mr. Lowe, I will personally look into it. I can't promise any more than that. If what he is telling me is correct, I mean, we're going on a phone call. Well, I if spoke to Mr. Killerview <coughs> this morning, who is the chief license inspector in New Westminster, and he said, I am totally amazed. He said, I don't know we have a more. Mr. Mayor, will you look into that Yes, one? I will look into it, Jack. You have my undertaking. Thank you, Rafe Mayor, Minister of Consumer and Corporate Affairs. Thank now, I'm going to set up and use my interview with Patrick Watson next. As I stand at the gate of the year <laughs> and look at the years the locusts have eaten, I think sadly and softly of old friends. And here he is, an old friend of mine, Patrick Watson. You keep using that word old. Just a minute. I'm not finished oh, my not little finished. hyperbole yet, Patrick. I think. Go on. Patrick Watson, whom I first met, oh, moons ago on a rude, rough course program called This Hour Has <laughs> Seven Days. Patrick, of course, has changed. I've seen him bewigged and powdered doing his CBC history bit. I've seen him doing his probing House of Commons things. I think he was down in New York doing something or other. He's a screenwriter, an aviator. He did the 700 million Chinese. And he is the fully rounded professional television producer, performer, and ham actor. How are you, Patrick? I can't tell whether you're jealous or annoyed. Well, make up your own mind. <laughs> when did we work on Seven Days? We worked on Seven Days in 1964, 65, 66. Should you realize the whole generation's up behind us who didn't see you on Seven Days, who've never true. heard of Seven Days? This is true, but they think they did. I ran into a guy in Winnipeg who said, you used to be on that great show, Seven Days, this hour of Seven Days. And yeah, I said, yes. He said, when was that, last year or the year before? It was an incredible program. And it was people like you and Leiterman and the guy who always burst into tears and used dirty language <laughs> who actually he, cut your own political thoughts on that program. No. You didn't? Nonsense. What happened to you after seven days? I went freelance, which I've been ever since. Oh, I got, you're you're not a corporation lapdog? No, 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 no. I've been a freelancer and happily, um, happily ungainfully employed part of that time. I had uh, about five years on the outs with the CBC. No, by Jove, seven years. Wouldn't speak to you? Not for longer than two or three sentences. I see. Yeah. What was your crime? Being unmanageable. Yeah, being loud yeah. and unmanageable. No, I was never loud. You were the loud one. I was never loud. You can't think of anything loud I ever did on CBC television. I, yeah, <laughs> perhaps I can't. You look loud. Yeah, I look loud. That's is this your same old radio desk you have at the other place? You no, just it stuck a monitor in? It is not. You're so cheap, you desk. probably imported all that stuff from the other. Oh, well. And you, of all people, a man of probity, yeah. dignity, yeah. yet out flogging a cheap book. It's not a cheap book. It's 1095. That's not cheap. And it's a damn good book, by the way. Did oh. you know that it was the only Canadian book on the best summer list in Canada, two weeks running? Oh. Yeah. You're telling me you're as successful and as bright as Pierre Burton who turns them out like a sausage machine factory? But he has a factory. I do them by myself. Oh, it's not a research? Is this a novel? Yeah, it's a novel. You can't interview MD about a novel. Do you mean you haven't read it? I wouldn't read it. Why not? Because it's a novel. I'll read it to you. I've never, I haven't read a novel in 20 years. What am I going to learn from a novel? What fact will I stack in the back of my little computer pygmyized brain to use later on the air? I bet you don't go to the movies. Or listen to music? My wife doesn't let me go to restricted <laughs> movies, right? I listen to music? Well, now and again. Yeah. 
plays, theater? No. No, no, no time for that. No time for I'm that. I'm a pragmatist. Okay, tell me about your book. I'll yeah. have a little sleep. I'm not smoking on the air these days. So face the camera or something. And, and I'm not going to face the camera and tell you about my book. Well, that's what you're here for. Flogging your book. Flog oh, your book. Well, it's <laughs> I don't need to flog it. It's going very, very well. We're going to make it into a movie, Jack. Did you ever meet Phil Fraser from Edmonton? The guy who uh, produced Why Shoot the Teacher? No. Lovely guy. No. A lovely guy. Tall handsome black guy from Vancouver, from uh, Montreal originally, mm -hmm. who's going to take the movie business in this country by storm. And uh, he and I are going to make a movie out of Alter Ego. What's the plot of the movie, even if I don't read the book? Ah, well, okay. A, guy's, a guy in Montreal, a physicist, a Scottish physicist, by the way, learns how to transmit people by radio. <laughs> You're talking about Star Trek. No, I'm talking about, I'm talking about a, a real conversation that I had with Buckminster Fuller on seven days by the way do you remember that in which he predicted that we'd be into that by the early on in the next century he told me that one day we would all live in our own little black box anywhere in the universe and be able to maintain our own environment around us recycling everything including our bad breath is that's that the right. man that's the one the guy who invented the geodesic dome that's the one is that the man yeah so Buckminster Fuller gave you this fabulous idea and I'm enthralled and want to hear all about it <laughs> I can see that you are it has turned into an enthralling novel in which, in the process of transmitting Jack Webster from his studio here in British Columbia down to Toronto where he belongs, a mistake takes place and as he arrives in Toronto, he is still here in Vancouver. The two Jack Websters must then meet and oh, deal with each other. matter and antimatter. No, they're both the same guy. Both the same guy? Yeah. And, uh... You mean the physical presence goes molecule by molecule yeah. and you split me into two, each of 110 pounds? Yeah. I see. And this is the plot for the movie? That's part of it. What else? It works very well. Uh, I don't think I need to tell you any more about the book, except that it's going gangbusters, and uh, it's been bought by Viking Press in New York, and it's going to be coming out there in the spring. And I'm very happy about it, and readers are very happy. May I tell you a story? Tell me a story. Listen, I'll be waiting you. for you to come up with some okay. kind of anecdote to brighten this <laughs> up this otherwise dull interview. <laughs> Thank you very much. The uh, Look, all the serious stuff aside, what I want to do when I'm doing a book like that is write a story that makes you read it. Even you, mm -hmm. having begun it, would read it through. I don't know whether I'll ever achieve that, but I'd like to. But when I was at the Canadian Booksellers Association conference in Quebec, and we launched the book in uh, paperback form or softcover form to the booksellers, uh, I met a young couple in their 20s who just opened a bookstore in the West somewhere recently, and they picked up a copy and I signed it for them, and uh, off they went. Attractive young couple, married. I saw them in the in the dining room of the hotel the next morning having breakfast. I was sitting there messing through my bacon and eggs and I looked over at the next table. Here they were and she had the book like this. And he was sitting there like this and I looked over and caught their eye and he looked over at me and he said, couldn't get anything going last night. That's the story? Yeah. <laughs> A cheap, sleazy, snide little double entendre. <laughs> what a double entendre. <laughs> Take your microphone off. I'm going to run this program. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Jack Webster program featuring Patrick Watson, my guest this morning in this 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. slot. Is, sl slot. Slot. Is Mr. Jack Webster, who used to be well known as a broadcaster in British Columbia. What's happened to you in the last I'm years? In Why have you, I'm hmm? in retirement now. Where did you disappear to? Well, I got fed up shuffling in and out of Toronto to do cheap. <laughs> throw away <laughs> shows <laughs> <laughs> like this hour at seven days. No, this right? hour at seven days was great. We had fun. But perhaps it's just because we're both in our early 60s now that we look back on it with fondness and we say there's nothing like it going in the country today. We're both in our early 60s. Each of us in, is in our early 60s or late 50s. Webster, I'm 48 years old. You're well, joking. I don't mind. I had a thing with Laurier. The other, last year we were doing a radio thing together and we saw each other every week and Laurier was going through one of those soul-searching things and he kept saying to, to me, after all, I'm 50, you know. And I kept saying to him, Laurier, you're not 50. You're the same age as me. You're 48. <laughs> Weeks go by. Laurier say, I don't know about that. I'm, I'm 50, you know. And I, so after about the fourth time, I said, you're not 50. You're 48. He said, Got you scared, eh? <laughs> <laughs> now, listen, just to, to, you know, as you get older, you begin to think back. Whatever became of Leiterman? Nasty little, tough little man. Wonderful. Totally competent. Yeah. First class journalist. Yeah. What became of Doug Leiterman? He's, he's a Vancouver in, boy. He's in the book in many respects. A lot of what that book's about is Doug Leiterman. 
uh, and some other folks we both know. He was the producer of Seven Days, of course. Yeah, he and I started it as co-producers. Oh, I that? thought he started it. No, we started it together, and then we, then I went in front of the camera in the second year. I was never on that program in the first year, except occasionally interviewing. Mm -hmm. Well, when do you remember John Draney had his his final nasty bout with cancer in the spring of the first year, and I subbed for him for a few weeks until he came back and did the last program of that first year, and then just before he died. Anyway, Leiterman is. Uh, He's got a cable business in Toronto. He's got a, a kind of sausage factory turning out some documentaries. He's geez, he's not making any documentary films. That's what I'm sorry about because he's so good have at that. Writing books, doing yeah. documentaries, going yeah. to star, star in films. Yeah. And graciously covering the country to let us know you're still alive. And coming coming and seeing some of my dignified. Look, don't you think this country's in a worse state than it's, no, than it's I ever don't. been in? I think that's a whole load of old toad. I think this country's in well, great shape. Do you live shape. in Ottawa? No, I don't. I live in the country. I live you live in the country close to Ottawa. Yeah, well, I sort of moved back and forth Ottawa, Montreal, Toronto. But listen, yeah, it's, but guys, can... it's guys in the media in our business who go around and say, oh dear, the country's in such dreadful shape. The country is not in dreadful shape. The country has more possibilities. I mean, I am not a fan of Pierre Elliott Trudeau, but I agree. You used to be. Yes, I did. Didn't you? Well, I go blow hot and cold in the mouth. Well, you looked pretty hot with him the last time I saw him. With that was you. an angry one. I did one the other day. That's what I was talking about. Yeah. yeah. You seem to like him pretty well. Oh, right? yeah. You blow hot and cold in the fellow. But he's right when he says that the country is, is potentially in terrific shape if people will only stop Say, oh God, it's we so have awful. a million so unemployed. We have a dollar down to 85, 84, which 83 most economists cents. say it should be at. Well, it should never have been up to a dollar or three. The manager. Okay, that was bad, but now it's probably where it should be. And what about this million unemployed? How many of those people, compared to 40 years ago, are really suffering from being unemployed? How many of them are in families where there are three or four breadwinners? We know that that's a large part of the story. But the damn press keeps going on saying worst unemployment statistics since since uh, the Depression. I'm one of those people who happen to think that unemployment insurance became a guaranteed annual income, and they're talking about taking it away now, and they cannot take it away. And you've got this dreadful political complication between the federal government and the provincial government. Jack, listen. In any country in the world, however well it's doing, there are always going to be complications and things for people like you and me to bitch about. What about Levesque? Where would you rather what live? About Levesque? Where would you rather live? This is in the world. Western Canada, British Columbia specifically. I wouldn't live in Montreal or Toronto if you gave me an index pension. Right? <laughs> I see? Don't know. I do. What? And I'm having a great time. And what about Levesque? So you never see the rest of the country. How do you even know about Levesque? You go to Ottawa once to interview the Prime Minister. Levesque? Is going to How lose. do you know about the rest of the country? You come here out to flog books? No, I come out here for a lot of things. You haven't done any serious reporting out here in 10 years. I come out here and I talk to people. And I, anyway, talk to, what kind of people do you talk to? The long hairs. Not Jack. Things. Not Jack. Oh, we must support Canada Council. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious me. <laughs> right? Matter. No. Must get more money Can from I tell the you about CBC. Yeah. Would you like to, do you want to bet? 30 seconds or less. Okay, he's going to lose the next election in Quebec. And, and uh, uh, Canada's going to have a lot more trouble with Claude Ryan than we ever had with Rene Levesque. You've been listening to me. No, I haven't. That's what I say. We agree? We agree. We finally agree about Patrick something. Patrick Watson, best of luck, old chap. Thank you. Alter your ego. <laughs> <laughs>